Hello, welcome to the Tuesday, November 2nd, 2021 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. A research paper entitled Trojan Source Invisible Vulnerabilities by two researchers at the University of Cambridge has gotten a lot of press yesterday. And the gist of the paper was that with Unicode, you have the option for bidirectional text or short bidy, which essentially allows you to not only have text running left to right, but also right to left. And the issue here is that if uh, this type of encoding is used in source code, the source code that a user sees may be different from the source code that is actually being compiled by a compiler. So the problem here is really the interface between user and code. How do we display code to the user the way the compiler sees it? And uh, these uh, bitey uh, character codes are getting in the way because uh, compilers are essentially ignoring them. But editors that are displaying Unicode may actually see them and then display the text differently than the compiler would interpret it. The paper lists a number of languages as susceptible, C, C++, C Sharp, JavaScript, Java, Rust, Go, and Python. One that's interestingly missing is Apple's Swift, which actually advertises as a feature that it does support full Unicode. So for example, you may use Unicode characters as variables. And of course, historically, Programming languages have been heavily uh, centered around English and have sort of adopted the uh, English conventions uh, for, for example, variable names and the like. But then again, there are other languages and the people who code in these other languages may want to use variable names in their native language and using their native script. The researchers uh, are recommending that the simplest option here is to essentially tell editors and compilers to just ignore those bitey codes and not allow the direction of the text uh, to change. That certainly uh, works and is probably the easiest to implement and sort of uh, corresponds with how usually developers think uh, compilers and code should work. On the other hand, uh, while there is certainly a possible impact of uh, this uh, particular technique, the impact, I believe, is rather limited. Nobody ever reviews code anyway, and any automated tools that are reviewing code should uh, probably read the code just like the compiler does and wouldn't suffer uh, from uh, this uh, confusion. It would also be relatively straightforward and simple to detect uh, these special uh, codes that are changing the direction of text within source code. So uh, developing just a very uh, simple and trivial scanning tool uh, for code uh, should be uh, very straightforward. And I would think uh, that if it hasn't already happened, a lot of the uh, source code uh, review tools will implement uh, features to detect this. So in short, uh, yes, it's something that you probably should sort of keep in mind if you are regularly reviewing source code that may originate from potential adversaries, but otherwise there always have been ways to obfuscate code and the uh, height functionality make it difficult to analyze uh, manually. This is just another trick and uh, nothing really I would worry about uh, too much. And this summer, researchers from Portsvigar, in particular uh, James Kettle and uh, Arnett Klein, have written some articles about uh, how to do HTTP request smuggling, in particular if you're using HTTP2 proxies in front of HTTP 1.1 web servers. Well, uh, if you're wondering if you're vulnerable, they're now coming out uh, with a free tool that allows you to scan for these vulnerabilities. The vulnerabilities are less so in your application, but really more in these setups where you do have an HTTP2 or HTTP3 probably soon, a web proxy in front of an HTTP 1.1 web server and web application that then can lead to some desynchronization between uh, 
the proxy and the web server and allow for HTTP requests smuggling. HTTP request smuggling is sort of one of those vulnerabilities that is often a little bit underestimated. I don't think it's the most critical vulnerability out there necessarily, but one of those vulnerabilities that are somewhat tricky to control in your application and undermine in some cases assumptions that your application may make about a request. And we've written about uh, before that uh, API keys are a big target these days because, well, they do allow authenticated access to many resources. The latest high-profile victim here is Kaspersky. Apparently, Kaspersky lost control of an Amazon simple email service uh, authentication token, and that token is now being abused to impersonate Kaspersky. Amazon's simple email service is an API that allows you to send email. And what Kaspersky did, which actually is not necessarily bad, but they created a token that authenticates the user as Kaspersky and gave that token to a third party that was essentially authorized now to send email as Kaspersky using Amazon's SES. The problem here was that that third party lost the token and as a result, whoever found the token is now able to send email as Kaspersky and that has been used uh, to send targeted phishing emails. Well, as usual, just be careful, don't trust any email and definitely don't trust any email that requests that you enter your Outlook 365 credentials into a non-Microsoft site. Well, that is it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow.